Coming right up, a special edition of Straight Talk. Our guest tonight, Admiral Eric Olson, former commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command, as we continue our 21st anniversary year. Closed captioning provided by Scan Health Plan. Straight Talk is brought to you in part by Southern California Edison. For over 100 years, life powered by Edison. The Press Telegram, your local news leader for over 100 years. Join us for tonight's edition of Straight Talk. And now your host, Art Levine. Good evening and welcome to In Conversation. I'm your host, Art Levine, professor of ethics and legal studies in the College of Business Administration at California State University, Long Beach. Our special guest tonight is Admiral Eric Olson, a four-star admiral, 38-year Navy SEAL, and until his recent retirement, commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command in charge of all special forces. He is legendary in his field and has been aptly described as the most important man you never heard of. We are honored to have Admiral Olson with us today. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Art. It's good to be with you. Admiral Olson is here on the campus of California State University, Long Beach, as our sixth annual distinguished speaker. And we were able to get him to come over and tape uh, this special show. And Admiral, we're honored to have you in our community. Thank you. Uh, tell the folks at home what Special Operations Command is all about. Yeah, the United States Special Operations Command is a command that was established uh, a little over 25 years ago to uh, to organize, train, equip, and send forward uh, the Special Operations Forces uh, from each of our military services. Army, Navy, Air Force, and now Marine Corps. It totals about 63,000 people, about 20,000 of whom are the operators of the Special Operations community, and the other two-thirds or so are the full range of disciplines that it takes to, to give them their, uh, their broad set of capabilities. It, uh, it, the, the command itself was legislated into being in the aftermath of our failure to rescue the 52 American hostages held in Tehran, Iran. Previously, in each of the special forces were within the branch With, of the within, military. Within each service. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps each had special operations forces. Uh, but a few years after that failure, it was decided uh, by the Congress that establishing a command that was solely focused on developing the nation's special operations capabilities with a dedicated budget uh, to do that, uh, with acquisition, with research authority uh, to do that, would make uh, that kind of complex operation uh, more likely to be successful should it have to be conducted again. And of course, there have been several operations since then that have been at least that level of complexity. And you were the first three-star admiral and four-star admiral to be in command of the U.S. Special Operations Command. I was the first uh, three-star Navy SEAL and then the first to be promoted to four stars and as well the first Navy officer to command the United States Special Operations Command, which can be commanded by any service, but the yes. majority of the forces is from the Army and so it had, had typically more Army commanders. Well, among the missions of your special operations, of course, was the one, the successful mission <coughs> that took down Osama bin Laden. And I know you can't go into detail about it, but tell us what you can about that successful mission. Yeah. First, first I want to be clear what my role was that it, in that was so that it's not overstated. Um, I had no operational authority uh, for that mission. I was responsible for providing the force uh, that conducted it. And along the way, I became involved in the training to a degree in the rehearsals and the recommendations. And then at the time of the mission itself, I was the senior military advisor in the, in the command center that was conducting uh, that operation. Um, but, uh, but what I took from that experience uh, really was five points worth, worth making, I think, to a broader audience. Uh, five factors that I think led to success, and it wasn't a perfect raid, none are, but uh, but, but this was a highly successful raid against a strategically important target. So I'd say first it was uh, sort of building the big team. Who needed to know about this? Who didn't need to know about it? Uh, how did you build a level of confidence across a complex joint 
uh, multi-service, interagency community uh, so that when it came time for the president to make the decision, he had the confidence that the right team had been put together to do that and they had done the right actions from the very beginning uh, to, to develop the, the mission to the point of um, where he would be confident in its success. Two, I'd say build the small team. Uh, the, who is actually going to be on the ground, in the air, on that compound, making those millions of decisions that have to be made almost in isolation because of the speed of the operation. Uh, and so this was a special operations uh, combined force that did this. It, it involved a ground force and an aviation force that had worked together on dozens, hundreds of missions uh, over the previous few years and had proven not only their knowledge and competence in each other, but uh, but to those who... And they had trained extensively, extensively. together. And we, I read that a full-scale mock-up of the compound yeah. was built and they yeah, practiced, exactly and, and right. you were in fact there when for some of that training. No, and I'll yeah, I'll get to that. I, I, I'd say point three is is be ready, and I would attribute many of the important decisions uh, that led to success on that raid to, to decisions that were not made in the weeks or months prior to it, but in in some cases a dozen or fifteen years prior. The the average age of the operator, either on the ground or or in the cockpit was mid-30s. The equipment that they flew was a dozen or more years old for the most part. The, the weapons that they carried, all of that was, uh, was a result of decisions that had made, been made a long time prior. So I can't overemphasize this, uh, this necessity to be ready because you, you don't know exactly what's going to come. And, and in, in my parochial view, I admit that's um, part of the value of creating the United States Special Operations Command 25 years ago. Fourth, directly to your point, is, is this plan train, rehearse, plan, train, rehearse, plan, train, rehearse, over and over and over again under the most realistic conditions that you can. Same time of day, sun at the same angle, same kind of weather, same kind of dust conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, over and over again. I liken it, to, and, and then train for success, um, although nothing will ever go exactly as it was planned. Uh, so you also train for failure so that you will deal, be able to deal with whatever does go wrong. And I liken it to uh, to a medical MRI, which slices a patient into hundreds of slices and lets the doctor look at each slice independently uh, to evaluate what might be wrong with the patient uh, in that slice. And, and if, you, if you think of slicing a mission chronologically into hundreds of slices, and in each slice think what can go wrong at this point, and if it goes wrong, what will we do about that? Uh, is is extraordinarily important, and, and in fact, the helicopter crash it proved itself. Yeah, as uh, as I think everybody now knows, one of the two helicopters carrying troops uh, onto that compound uh, crashed in a in a lot next door to to the lot where the house was. And you would think that that's a devastating accident. Abort uh, the mission. It, abort the mission, but in, in fact, that wasn't the case. They had prepared for precisely that contingency, and it was a, 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 a pretty flat voice over the radio uh, that said roughly, uh, we've got a helicopter down, we're executing the contingency plan. And the fact that there was a plan and everybody was confident in it made And you had trained on that plan. They Absolutely. had trained on that plan. Plan rehearsed, yeah. And, uh, and then fifth is, is the value of keeping secrets secret. Uh, those who did know about that raid in advance didn't talk about it. There were no indications. It was a complete surprise, and it was essential that it be a complete surprise. And then in the aftermath, of course, uh, to protect those who were involved, to protect their, uh, their families and their capabilities, um, the less said, the better. Well, um, as you know, uh, a book came out written by a former SEAL, an unauthorized book, and uh, uh, I understand the SEAL community is not happy about that, and the command staff is not happy about that, and, uh, but it was widely publicized, and he was on 60 Minutes. Uh, how does something like that happen when you have someone who is trained to be a SEAL, it's so much a matter of teamwork, and something, someone leaves the reservation like that? Yeah, to their great credit, the community is full of people who don't highlight their own successes or advertise the nature of their work. Occasionally, uh, one wants to tell uh, his story. And, uh, and in this case, I think that really he put himself in, in triple jeopardy. He, he is facing some sort of 
action, some sort of criminal or civil action. Of course, the confidentiality agreement was signed with the SEALs. Absolutely. He's facing uh, being ostracized by his teammates uh, who don't appreciate sort of private conversations being replayed in, in, uh, in best-selling books. And he is arguably f putting himself at higher risk. Um, the Al-Qaeda websites were pretty vibrant with, uh, with his name once it became known. And, uh, and, and he, he would be, in the view of some, obviously a, a higher priority a target himself for having identified himself as being on that mission. It doesn't happen often. You still don't know the names of the three SEALs who shot the pirates on the Marisk, Alabama. You don't know who pulled Saddam Hussein out of his hole. You don't know the names of any other uh, person who was on the bin Laden raid, and, and that's the way the community prefers to keep it. There's something to a civilian uh, very moving about this concept of teamwork, having each other's back, uh, knowing that if you get into trouble, uh, your teammates will be there for you, and, uh, and doing things privately without bravado and getting the job done. Uh, it, it, is a, it is part of the culture of the special operations community. Every community has its culture, and, uh, and within the culture of the special operations community is, is precisely that. People have not uh, typically highlighted their own individual contributions, but instead wanted to give the team credit. And the SEALs that make it through training, the Admiral was telling me before we went on air, you were in a class of 54 SEALs, and they're all obviously uh, been pre-screened, but out of those 54, only four made it to become SEALs. Correct. So the attrition rate is very high in the training. Historically, it is high. It's a demanding course. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a little interesting piece of that, not well understood uh, by me until later in my career. Uh, about 80% of those who start don't make it, no matter how fit or motivated they are. About 70% of the ones who don't make it leave of their own accord. They just decide one day to, uh, to leave the program. Uh, and about 70% of those leave either at breakfast or during lunch. It is, it is fear of the next hard thing, something you know is going to might be cold, miserable, painful, uh, it's the fear of taking that on that causes most people to, to leave. Uh, very few people quit actually in the middle of an event. Uh, once they start it, they tend to see them see it through. So from that perspective, it's a very successful program and sort of weeding out those who are afraid to take on something because it might be really hard. Well, as we end this segment, let me uh, share a, a SEAL philosophy, which I know you know only too well, which I just recently read. The only easy day was yesterday. <laughs> kind of sums up what you were saying. We'll be back with this wonderful interview after these messages. Supported by Edison International. Californians are getting to be old hands at year-round energy conservation, part of our special awareness of the resources we all depend on. We're making the change to energy-efficient light bulbs, keeping warm weather thermostats set to a comfortable 78 degrees, and giving major appliances the afternoon off. Because when it comes to energy conservation, it all adds up. Life, powered by Edison. In today's world, everything's connected. From the workplaces that support us, to the homes that welcome us, to the trees and wildlife habitats that remind us how important our environment is. When a bird lands on a branch, and in the midst of a busy day, we stop to watch. It makes us realize we're all in the same boat. The Port of Long Beach welcomes this world with open arms, an environmental policy that's second to none, and a commitment to shaping a vibrant community. The Port of Long Beach, thinking outside the docks. Hello, I'm Jessica Hardy, a proud Long Beach native and a member of the USA Swimming national team. Having spent much of my life in water, I've developed a deep appreciation for the valuable role that this precious resource plays in our lives. In recent years, California's water supply has become unreliable. To address this reality, Long Beach residents have dramatically reduced their water use through permanent lifestyle changes. In doing so, Long Beach has made itself a leader in water conservation. As I work hard to achieve my personal goal of qualifying for the 2012 Summer Olympics, 
I encourage you to continue your tremendous efforts to use water in smart and responsible ways. So join me and your fellow Long Beach residents in strengthening the water conservation movement. By making small but significant changes in our water use habits, together we can ensure that we have a reliable water supply for many generations to come.